Okay, so um, let's start. I will I will start, Steve, and then I'll introduce you. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name Excuse is Elisa Marquez. Yes. Any documents that you're sharing, can you please upload or screenshot for us? I happen to be in my car and would appreciate it. Uh, yes, we will be sharing it uh, later on on here on the chat, but we will also uh, share it with whoever attended after uh, Steve sends me the list of everybody that attended. Just Thank like you so much. Yes, no problem with that. So um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Aliyah Marquez. I am the chair for the Waste Commission of Florida Colleges. Um, with us today, um, our presenter will be Stephen Crudup, which who is right now appointed as the chair elect. Um, our past chair is Ryan Buckthorpe. I, our secretary also with us here is Doreen Singer. Um, our treasurer, we do not have a treasurer that uh, position is vacant. Uh, right now, Sandy Barrett, which is our historian is covering treasurer and historian. So if anybody's interested in uh, getting one of these two positions, just uh, contact me and uh, we will uh, talk about it. We are looking for a region one representative. That's the Florida Panhandle. Uh, in region two, Janaya James is our representative. Region three is Catherine Lemaire. Um, and region four is also vacant because that was Steve's position before. Now, so that position now is vacant. We're looking, also looking for somebody there. And Region 5, we have uh, Dalila Rodriguez, who is also here with us. Um, as Steve is sharing right now, you can see our website, uh, the waste email that we have, our YouTube channel link, and our Facebook link. So we're almost everywhere um, so that we can get all the information that you all need. We're just not hip enough for Instagram, apparently. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, um, I'm almost there. <laughs> it's a lot, but yeah, I'm almost there too. Um, so uh, our presentation today, it's called Gen Z and CTE. Um, Generation Z has changed the face of education in the classroom in many ways. This session will cover some basic information about Generation Z students and observations on how their needs impact the delivery of career and technical education and workforce training. Through thoughtful discussion, we can determine best practices to serve them before the next generation is in our classrooms and workshops. Our presenter, Stephen Kudup, is the Assistant Dean for the Post-Secondary Adult Vocational and Workforce Programs at Hillsborough Community College. Um, he is the current uh, chair elect before he was the region four representative for the Waste Commission and has been following the impacts of Gen Z in not only the classroom, but adapting extracurricular activities, leadership programs and communication styles to best reach the range of generations in our cohorts today. This specific program was first at the AFC annual conference in November of 2020. So without further ado, Steve, the floor is yours. No well, thank you very much. Um, well, of course, if my best laid plans, right? Technology is always our friend. Right. <laughs> Remind ourselves this. There we go. Um, yes, again, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Steve Crudup. I uh, wanna say thank you for coming today. Um, I'm in spring break mode this week, so I apologize. Um, hair's not done, so I had to wear a hat. Also, it kind of worked out with I'm 24% Irish, so I'm wearing a green shirt and a little, little fun little cap today to kind of blend in since it is uh, technically St. Patrick's Day. Second time, yay, in pandemic times. But I wanna say uh, thank you for coming and I hope this is an interesting uh, presentation for everyone. Um, before we get started, I do wanna say thank you to Waste and AFC for the opportunity to present this. 
Um, I did have the opportunity to present it during the AFC annual conference, and there was a lot of very positive feedback, and I appreciated that very much. And with that, want to make sure I can do this again as many times as I can for folks. Um, also, for anybody who might not be as familiar with waste specifically, or you came in through invitations from others, um, this is going to be focusing on CTE, which is our, our career and technical education programs. But the strategies are not just limited to those by any means. And there are obviously some takeaways that can go um, into any classroom setting or any kind of educational setting, and as well as some broad ones. And then also, I just want to do a reminder to please mute um, while, while we're talking today um, and put questions in chat. Um, we will open the mics later on, um, as well as uh, Dalila and Doreen are watching the chat for me so that if any questions come up along the way, they're just going to pop in and let me know um, if you have any questions that that need to be answered as we move forward. So um, that is that as far as the housekeeping goes. <laughs> Excuse me. So we'll get into the bulk. Um, so our session outline today, this is not going to be a super heavy session. I want everybody to understand that I'm really here to focus, um, give you some kind of interesting and fun information, as well as talk about observations that that I've made. Um, and then we're going to go into open discussion so that we can see how we can utilize this information to serve our students better. I do wanna clarify, uh, just to make sure that everybody understands that this is not my personal research. Um, the research, I have a basis for the people that I've been following uh, for a lot of reasons, and I'll talk a little bit about them later on. Uh, but this is not my personal research into this. Um, I just became a really interested person talking about generations and generational impact back when I was in graduate school uh, last year. Kidding, uh, no, <laughs> it wasn't last year, it was a hot minute ago. Uh, but when I was in graduate school, um, we had a class that specifically covered generational differences in the classroom. And um, I thought it was always intriguing to me. And so I've always kept my mind open to that. But I would say that, um, where we thought millennials really kind of hit us hard and, and, and said we have to change a lot of the things that we're doing. Um, Generation Z I'm feeling is way more impactful and we haven't talked about it much. Um, and so with that and my observations personally, I was just like, I need more people to know. I need, we need to be talking about this more, which really kind of brought up this discussion for me. And um, every time I have it, I see, I feel that more and more people go, Oh yeah, um, and, and it really kind of brings them on, aboard, on board to recognize some of these changes. So that's why I wanted to kind of do this as a whole for everybody. Um, so let's get started with some of the fun stuff. Okay, first and foremost, before we really get deep into this, I do wanna throw out some considerations. Um, obviously not all claims about generations apply to everybody, they are generalities. Um, just like theory, it's just useful for guiding, guiding information. So when I talk about Gen Z as a whole, I'm not talking about all the differences within Gen Z from socioeconomic to racial differences to uh, family differences, et cetera. I'm just talking about that generality um, just for guidance. Um, also, we're talking about specific, uh, today we're talking about CTE specifically and career and technical education. Um, we have our unique needs, just as the credit bearing courses do, just as um, any other types of courses would. Um, each of us, hey, if anybody's, you know, I have to finish my doctorate at some point, you know, um, or waste those credits I already have. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, if, you know, if I, if I don't get there, you know, and, and have, to have the chance to write the book, I'm expecting that somebody else is going to be writing that book for us. Uh, along the way, because we could write a an entire an entire book, not just a chapter on on the differences with our programs and how we can adjust. Um, I do also want to remember that we are not going to just have Gen Z in the classroom with any of our classrooms. We are state community college environment. Um, 
we work with all generations. Um, I know in our programs right now in workforce, we have every we have 60 year olds working with 17 year olds. That's our youngest population, you know. And so we can see all of the generations that are currently alive that we're aware of, um, you know, in our classrooms at the same time. So we cannot just shift to the needs of just one generational learning style, which makes that very challenging for us. Um, but at the same time, I think it's important to be aware of how you can reach as many as possible. And then lastly, just as an educator in general, obviously I have to say like we have, all of our students have specific needs and, and we need to try to do our best to reach them individually. So it's important to know how to best serve everybody and treat everybody as individuals when you can. But we do want to understand some of those general theories and best practices so that we can try to reach them in, in the most impactful way. Okay, so those are considerations. AKA everything is with an asterisk. You know, that's what we have to understand and just make sure that um, this is not, you know, 100% accurate for all people in all situations. Okay. So uh, what do we know about Generation Z? Well, what we know is that currently it's defined as the post-1995 to 1997 era of births. Um, and then right now, it seems as though that the generation is being defined as only a 10-year generation, which is way different. Um, it's being said to end in that 2006-2007 birth period, which is really an interesting point. Usually generation's about 20 years. So it's seeing that this might be a, a quicker turnaround until we get to Generation Alpha. Um, disasters and tragedies have sadly always been in part of their lives. Uh, recognize that this is the first generation has, that has dealt with school shootings for their entire lives since they've been in school. Um, you know, there. But on the positive, there's more women and people of color have been in leadership roles than ever before. So they've had role models that have been different from the traditional, what many of us may have grown up with as far as leaders. Um, social movements on equality and equity are, have been are normalized for this group. Um, They've heard of things such as uh, the civil rights movement and women's movement and LGBT movements and such, but that's, that is old hat for them. They've known that their entire lives. Um, information has always been at their fingertips um, and they have constant connection. Um, you know, I can still reflect on the time when I didn't have a computer. You know, uh, many, many of us probably in this group can. Um, but these students have always had something where they've been connected, whether it be a phone, whether it be a computer, whether it be at school, whether it be at home. Um, you know, so somewhere in their lives on a daily basis, they're connected. Um, so if, and some of the key factors have been, if it's online, it's true. And that's, everybody takes that with a grain of salt, but, but in some way, shape or form, if it's online, it's true. Either whether somebody says, um, I did this or whether it's something that was found later on, there, there's a truth, there's always a grain of truth if it's online. There's a FOMO issue, which is fear of missing out. There's so many options for things that are happening um, that it's, there's a diff, it, there's almost anxiety built in to making decisions, you know, um, and, to, and because you could do all of these things. There's so many different things happening, you know, back in my day, you know, it's like you got the invite to a party and you went to that party. That was which, how you focused. That is very different from this group. Um, there's, there might be all kinds of different things happening and they want to be involved in all of them. Um, and then the other piece is each social media platform has a very specific role in their lives. Um, you know, YouTube is for education. Um, Instagram is for your friends. Facebook is for family members. Um, you know, there, there are very specific roles. They have multiples. You know, I remember getting on Facebook. I mean, I'll own it that I'm Gen X, you know, and I didn't want to get on Facebook but once I finally got on Facebook, 
it took my entire world just to control what I put on Facebook. So all my energy, it was like, oh, you know, um, <laughs> that was just too much for me to share. But, uh, but once I got used to it, I was like, I don't want to learn any other social media platforms. <laughs> You know, whereas these students um, are on four to five to six on average, um, you know, and so we have to find ways to still meet them, find them, connect with them. Um, and then also they believe in creative entrepreneurship, which is which is going to be a huge part of what we do with them um, and which is about taking care of yourself, because a lot of it comes from a feeling of um who's going to take care of them so they have to take care of themselves um so and and not wanting to work or waste your time for other people those are aspects that come in there so think of things like youtube um kickstarter gofundme there's a hustle there's a hustle economy or the gig economy that comes out of that and that's going to be something that really permeates how we work with them in cte programs so um, here's what we know about their communication styles. They're often across five different screens on a daily basis. If you think about that, that means their attention span is not really on you, it's on all of those different screens. So you gotta find ways to connect to them on those multiple screens. Um, they prefer frequent communication spurts rather than lengthy exchanges. So think of how you can engage in that way. Uh, of all things, and this is probably the biggest surprise for a lot of people to understand, is they do prefer in-person communication. Ironic, a lot of us say we have to communicate over email, text, phone. They do prefer in-person communication, but there are some caveats with that, again, with a big asterisk, at the moment when they want that interpersonal communication. So... You can probably think of the times like after class or during class where they're like, I have a question. I need that, I need this question answered right now. If you don't answer that question right then, right now, there, there could be an anxiety or they can't focus or they, there might be some pieces that, um, that get lost because they're not thinking about anything else other than their question at that moment when they want that interpersonal communication. And that also happens, you know, like if you want to meet with the student after class, if they have a question, they're going to come by your office. They want an answer right then, right then, right now. So, but, so they prefer that and they prefer that to be in person. Um, if you can't do that, the number two way is texting because it's there and it's also connected. And then lastly, um, kind of there's a tie for email and phone. Um, but again, they don't want to have long conversations. Um, they don't like to be tracked online. Uh, they prefer ways where they can contribute being an anonymous contributor. Um, they love to be experts. So if they can provide expertise in some kind of other way um, to their, their fellow students. So think about um, how you could utilize boards um, you know, of communication or think of things like Reddit, which are, which is an extremely popular um, website, uh, if you haven't looked into that, uh, where folks can go on and just make comments and, and share information that they found, um, they, where they become almost an expert to other people, but they like to stay anonymous. Um, and just knowing that they have shared this knowledge and this expertise. Uh, but they don't need to walk around saying like, I'm an expert, you know, that type of thing. Um, and then lastly, integrate technology however you can. However, you can. however we are gonna talk about that technology issue where, where, there, where that can be a problem later on. Uh, what we also know about their motivations. Uh, role models include their parents, teachers, coaches, peers, and fictional characters. Uh, first generation in a long time where that fictional character issue is that uh, think Hunger Games, think Divergent, think other things, you know, where YA fiction has been written directly for them with these inspirational characters. Uh, so they look up to some of that. Uh, but however, what's not been motivating to them are bosses, people who are seen as their bosses, uh, politicians, 
athletes, celebrities, and religious leaders. Those are not motivational characters to them. Um, so this is that, you know, they're not really looking up to these folks that have, that are unattainable in a lot of ways, or that don't reflect their needs and concerns. Um, it, and then they're not motivated by title alone. Um, a title is just a title. Uh, they're not motivated by other people's validation like, like the millennial generation was. Uh, I think we, we found that very, that's something that's extremely different between um, what research is finding in this generation versus millennial is they don't necessarily need that pat on the back for everything that they do. Um, spoken as a Gen Z or sorry about that. Everybody might say millennial. That's not, a, that's not meant to be offensive, just stating facts of what we know. Um, they also tend to lean more socially moderate to liberal. Um, they are, but at the same time, they're fiscally moderate to conservative. So they're not about spending money wildly um, for, for any reason. Um, and, and that will come into a little bit later on as we discuss. Um, they, they see voting, they're the least likely to vote, but they are very socially aware. Um, they're the least likely to vote generation in, in many cycles, um, but they are the most socially aware students and, and generation. They know what's going on they just don't feel as though um, there's a benefit to voting because it's not going to change anything by voting alone. We have to make, they have to make the change internally. So they're mentally engaged, easily, um, in a, um, so I'm forgetting the word I'm trying to use, but they'll come together around a topic and issue a discussion um, but, the, but voting is not the way to do it. You need to make change from other ways. Uh, they also want to be involved, uh, but are not necessarily willing or interested in taking on the implications of being in charge. So, they, so there has to be some kind of way that we can engage them in the process, but not make them to be the person who has to take the ultimate responsibility for it to be done. Um, and then lastly, they're motivated by change and passion. Um, if you can, any way to help them make a difference, leave a legacy, have a long-term success, um, make a change in a program, change in the classroom, um, any kind of, anything of that nature that we can do is great. Um, in pulling together some of the motivations, I wanted to give some very specific things from the research that has shown that Top row motivators, uh, there are three top motivators. One is relational. Uh, they don't wanna let people down. Uh, they wanna make a difference for someone else. It's not about for themselves. It's not about I want, I want, I want. It's about I'm going to do this because I wanna make sure that everyone, it, it, it's not gonna be different. It's gonna be different for everybody behind me. And they wanna make sure that they don't let people down. Um, they want to advocate for something that they believe in. Um, and then there are some earning rewards that are there uh, where they do want to see opportunities for whatever they're doing to help them move forward. Uh, you know, like by, by, by doing a protest, by doing this job, that there is going to be an opportunity for me to move forward. Um, you know, not not step back and have to start over. So there is some kind of receiving credit along the way for good behavior, for doing positive things, for, for making an impact. Um, their two top, top non-motivators are public validation and the acceptance of others for their actions. They don't really care what other people think. They're not looking for public validation. They're really doing it from a, a place in their heart and making a difference. Um, and then money for longevity. Um, you know, 42% of millennials said they'd work harder to stay with an employer for a higher salary, where 28% of Gen Z are saying the same thing. Um, significantly different 
and that Gen Z is not going to work harder to stay with an employer for a higher salary. You know, that's just using an example there, um, that the money is not the motivator um, to have you to stay for a while longer. You know, so that's not something that they're looking toward. Um, so as far as learning styles, um, where they prefer practical learning, um, facilitated learning, uh, working independently, um, solo work that leads toward group work, um, setting their own pace and self-reflection. Um, those are some of those very practical pieces that um, our students are, the, these students are looking for. Um, ironically, I think a lot of what we're showing fits very well with our types of programs. Um, what they don't prefer are information dumps where you just give them a ton of information. They want to be able to understand it as you're going in. So if you have instructors who are just that person who just like, has to get it all out, there's a point where they shut down, shut off. They need to be able to be able to make it um, practical. Um, group only work, um, that's not how they tend to like to work. And then creativity and imaginative processes, um, that's just not how this, this generation really works. So you have to be able to give them some guidance. So those times where we might go, create this idea, that's not going to work so much. It's sort of, you have to give them some parameters to work around. Um, socially, they love to be around other people, but not to have to work with them. So, um, you know, it's great to have people around you. For the, it gets to drawing that energy from them and, and energy and, and vibe and that we're all similar, but doesn't really want to have to work with them. Um, they do like applicable learning that's real life. And then um, the concept of a flipped classroom is, is very important where they can be seen as an expert or uh, someone who knows something. Um, if you're familiar with the, clip, with the flipped classroom philosophy in education, it's where the instructor really, really gives the topic to a student and has that student to teach their peers. Or, you know, and, and they've done that. I just want to put that out. They've been doing this since they were in kindergarten. Uh, they've been flipping classrooms, everything from, think of show and tell. I mean, but it's a way deeper show and tell. It's, it's, it's having them actually teach, but it also gives the instructor the ability to assess whether or not that individual has learned the, learned the information. Um, and so flipped classrooms have always been in their lives. So any way that you can have them do that in some unique way, um, whether that be through video, whether it be through in class, um, that, that's something that can be extremely helpful. Um, there's also a lot of discussion about settings. Um, now I know in our programs that might not be able to do this, but do think about this and encouraging them in study, in study situations, which is, quiet or soft music, a, a physical space that's clean and focused, and people in that space who are also similarly focused and passionate about what they're doing. So, um, you know, there, again, there's this whole energy, there seems to be this whole motivational energy that goes along with this process and with this, with this group. So moving into observations. Um, Let's just say straight up, because I said so does not work anymore. Um, telling, you know, doing things the way they've always been done will not work. Um, and the other piece that's extremely important in understanding with, the, with this current generation is if, if you want to, if we want to be very clear, um, this is a stubborn generation. We are not, we are going to have to adapt point blank period, underscore, exclamation point. Like we, we have to adapt to their needs. Um, you know, you, can't, you can no longer just say, because I said so, that's why I'm the teacher. That's why I asked you to do this. We have to adapt to their concerns. Um, and a couple of the pieces that have been really important um, that have, have come out of this are consistency. 
Um, how are they utilizing phones? This is the generation that is gonna call you out. We'll put it that way. If you're not consistent with rules in class, if you're not consistent with phones, use of phones, if safety, if you've said, we're gonna send you home if you're not wearing your safety glasses in the shop. And the first time you don't do that and you try to hold someone else accountable and they saw that someone didn't, you didn't do it, they're gonna call you out. They're gonna, and they're going to make sure that that's clear to everybody about what's, what's not fair, what is fair, how that is. Uh, they know, they've seen it. They probably have taken a picture of it, <laughs> if not videoed it. Um, so that they have it for proof. Um, but co consistency in the classroom and the way that you work with these students is extremely important. Now, um, how can you invest, how can you really invest them in that process, which is they need to learn how to, and, and I think it's a valued point is they want to hold each other accountable more than anything. It's, it's about an accountability as a group. Again, they want to be in a room with people who are equally passionate and interested as they are. So how can you work together to achieve that goal rather, better than holding each other accountable, rather than having the teacher or the instructor or the lab tech or whoever being that person who is going to hold everybody accountable? If we can hold each other accountable and say, don't do that, that's not okay. So wherever possible, peer accountability, um, invest time at the beginning with setting ground rules so that everybody understands. Yes, give them structure, but at the same time, um, give them, say, here are some minimums. You guys come up with the rest and, and figuring out how to, how to hold each other accountable. Um, you know, set those boundaries. Um, but always when you, when you do set a boundary, um, expect to be asked why. So, and because I said so, again, it's not going to work. So when someone sets a boundary, when you set a boundary, if you're like, if you make a change in the middle of class, we're going through this right now with one of our cohorts where the instructor, where the instructor allows some people to have phones and not pe pe other people to have phones <laughs> um, in class because of certain reasons. And some students are like, it's not my, you know, that's not fair. And so, you know, and I told him that from the very beginning that that might be something that might come up. Um, and now he's, he's struggling to find ways to address that issue. So expect to be asked why and, and make sure that you're consistent no matter what you do. Um, I think we have a new word that's come up in the past probably three or four years, which is ghosting. A lot of us may have heard of this. Um, and the way that it's come up is in a lot of ways is when things get difficult or challenging or whatever, people tend to ghost, which means they just disappear off the planet. You can't get a hold of them in email. Um, you can't get a hold of them on the phone. You can't, they're not on social media. They just disappeared. Um, it's also a, blo a blocking culture. People do that too. Like if something makes you uncomfortable, you just block it, block it out of your life. Um, but I do wanna be very clear that ghosting is, is important for a lot of people because it's a protection mechanism. Um, you know, whether that be that they're struggling and they just don't wanna admit it, uh, whether they're challenged in there, just don't want to admit it, whether they just have so much else going on around them that the only thing that they can do is eliminate stuff that's happening in their lifetime, in their, in their immediate need area. So don't assume that everyone ghosts for the same reason. And also don't assume that they're being lazy when they're ghosting because there can be something that's happening um, in the meantime. I did see a chat flash here. Let me see this. Yes, there you go. Exactly, Tom. Um, MIA ghosting is exactly what is is there hap is happening. Um, with you know, and and it actually is a very good verb. A lot of people have been using it as a verb lately. Ghosting. Um, 
Now, how can we address this issue? Um, I'm very fortunate that at, at Hillsborough Community College, our CTE area, um, we have our very own kind of workforce area where we're in a location separate from the main campus. And so we have our own little bubble. In our bubble, I'm fortunate enough to have a student services staff that specifically is, is designed to address things happening in our bubble. Um, I know not every institution has that opportunity to do that. Um, we do obviously have to farm out some of our more complicated issues to others, um, you know, because we don't have our own counselor, we don't have our own this, but we do fortunately have our own academic advisor and student services staff, um, like our own career planning and placement individual, our own um, student success coordinator who kind of serves in those intermediate roles. But, you know, what options do you have within your, within your, department or your program to offer support in hard times for students? How are you getting into the classroom and talking to them about, um, you know, where they can go to get help? Do they know how to address um, challenges? Um, you know, what is the ease of accessibility for support? Um, are they going to be able to talk to strangers or do they get to talk to people that they know and comfortable with? Are your instructors well informed? Because I can tell you our instructors aren't. I can be honest with you about that, that they're not as informed about, um, you know, they're awesome. They're awesome trainers because they train in the areas that they're experts at and industry and, and that. But as far as there's, is there an ethic of care that's fully been invested and that they are really truly understand some of the, um, you know, some of the, you know, educational components of everything, that's still an area we need to work on. Um, so how can we make our students feel more comfortable if they have a challenge that's happening, whether it be family, friends, uh, whatever, how are we going to help support them um, in getting them to the people that they need to talk to? when that's not comfortable in, in these fields that we might be talking about as well. Um, so, and also is it on site versus do they have to go somewhere new? Cause I can tell you if I hand most of my students a business card and say like, here, go to the main campus and find this person who is in this building and they've, they're not gonna do it. You know, it's, so it's facil how do we facilitate those connections with people as well? Um, and then how are we also encouraging them? It's a soft skill, dealing with challenges, learning, um, learning how, to, how to deal with frustrations, conflict, et cetera. How, do we, how, do we, how are we role modeling that for our students? How are we teaching them to do that once they get into the industry? Come on. So, Sorry, I clicked away off the main window. There we go. So um, sorry for all, all the words here, but, um, but as far as instructional techniques, another place, place that's very important, feeding the entrepreneurial spirit. We've talked about, entre we talked about the gig culture um, and entrepreneurship, but what are some ways to engage in this area? Um, this group of students are the first ones who are really coming in that aren't thinking of things as traditional employment models. You don't just get a job and work for a company for 30 years anymore. You think about all the ways that, that they could do it on their own. Um, we started seeing some of this with millennials, but it, there's a different, different motivation. Um, within the millennial culture, it was seen a little more as social climbing or the ability to say, look at all these things that I'm doing that, that bring people in to see that I'm an expert, right? Um, versus this, this group of students are motivated because they want to gain experience and have momentum to do their own thing eventually. Um, this is where apprenticing really is gonna be something that's really important where getting them the experience and interest to be able to 
eventually open their own company or do their own business is what they're looking to do. They're not necessarily looking to work for one company with good benefits for 30 years. So how can we get them to develop themselves to be in a place where they're going to grow and succeed long-term? Um, one of the pieces that I'm, I'm hearing a lot more, and some of you may have, have more information than I do on this, but um, I would not be surprised to see that our CTE curriculum is gonna be expanding in the very near future, um, particularly the career readiness side and employability side to include, to include this area of entrepreneurship. Um, I know it's, it's been discussed for several years and, and it sounds like that there might be some additions going into that. So expect that we might be doing some more on that area. Um, and again, we've talked about flipping a little bit. Um, they've always done it, um, stop traditional lecturing where you can and have students help instruct their fellow, inst their fellow students. Um, provide feedback, you know, like where, like we're used to instructors just going around in the classroom and saying, do this, do this, do this. If they can learn from their peers, there's also some positivity that goes into their employability and soft skills as well. Um, you know, we want to engage that social feedback loop, um, help them encourage thoughtful commentary, um, you know, be able to learn to take and give critical feedback in the workplace. Um, and those are all some skills that can come into and really engage this group. Um, and then another one that, is, that has gained a lot of momentum through a lot of different ways is what, what's generally called gamification. Um, there's a lot of really great research into gamification. I would highly recommend you to look it up if you're interested. Um, but utilizing terms like leveling up where, um, where folks can start stacking credentials in order to move further along in their educational path and to grow. Um, things like badging when they do something really positive, something that they can put on a virtual um, platform or portfolio, whether that be their LinkedIn or their LinkedIn or some other kind of portfolio that's out there. And then also there are some very specific, um, I would say educational tools that are out there. Uh, for example, in automotive services and diesel engines, there's a program called Electude um, that we utilize, which um, is, it allows them to practice things as practically as possible, um, but also makes it sort of like a video game. And when they start connecting pieces together, um, you know, there's one function within it, for example, where it's, it's almost like a puzzle where you can you get an engine in front of you and you take that engine apart or do whatever. And while you're doing it, it gives you a total of all of the hours that you had spent physically doing it, as well as gives you a total at the end of how much the repair would cost the consumer. So so it's teaching them a lot of different skills not only exact it's not only like operation where they're teaching like where the right things but also they're seeing the impact in in the the bottom line and those real world teaching techniques and and how you can make it fun and interesting and unique um, also when it comes to that um, in the stackable credential areas are there ways for students to be able to keep the what they're learn they're learning and bank it for the long term so that when they make a decision to do something else down the line that they don't lose the momentum that they've already gained. Um, when it comes to recruiting, there are some significant aspects that are different. Um, this is the first real generation I mean, millennium, millennial students were willing to go to college and understanding that debt was coming, right? This group is, they don't want any debt from jump. <laughs> so um, so there's, there, that is an important aspect from a recruiting standpoint that, they under, that we understand that they don't want any debt. Um, they want a job that will get them a decent salary right away out of college. They want those options for leveling up and the stackable credentials 
that we've talked about. Um, they they want to be able to utilize it in the future. So my question is, do you have a matriculation, matriculation agreement within or outside your institution where those credits can be reused? Fortunately at Hillsborough, we do. For example, um, they can matriculate into our management program. Um, and then from there go on to USF um, and matriculate there. So are there ways that they can reuse these programs? Um, they don't lose it, they lose the motivation. Um, we want to maintain relationships. So if you can get into the schools and meet with students or talk to them early, um, they want to maintain relationships, just not through a pushy manner. Um, the traditional methods, I mean, we all know, like, if we get a phone call, we just don't answer it. That's an easy, easy way to get out of things. Um, you know, if a recruiter contacts me about something and I have time to get back with them, you know, I will. But um, if they keep contacting me, I will just stop talking to them, period, right? So that's, we don't want that to happen. We want to make sure that they're not being pushy that we're maintaining relationships, we're inviting them out, making them feel like a part of the family. Um, you know, and then when family understands that this is going to be an exciting job where possible and getting them into this career, um, you know, and then hopefully their peers are gonna say, oh my gosh, this is a great opportunity, uh, giving them time to come into the classroom, um, get in and do experiments. It sounds like a lot, and it is a lot. So our recruiters have to actually put in this effort to try to develop these longer term relationships um, to be more effective and really get these students in our door. Um, technology wise, now, I think we all have this opinion, and at least I did, I know, and I'm not, I'm just me. But the, what I thought was, oh, these students have a lot of technology. Now, they do have a lot of technology and access technology, but do they have the right kind of technology is always the major question. I think COVID response really identified uh, the gaps in our understanding and, and as a whole. And, you know, this is where I recognize that I learned a lot. Um, we all assume that generations these students are technologically savvy, technologically savvy, and that's not true. Um, they know they know how to use social media. They know how to text. They know how to do certain pieces. But our students really did not have access to the technology that they needed to be able to do work. Um, they didn't have access to. Um, to laptops, they didn't necessarily have access to uh, wireless at home like we thought that they did. Um, we made assumptions that they had internet available at home, but what we realized is that a lot of them are using, you know, their phone to do a lot of things because they have unlimited plans, but they don't necessarily have, they didn't necessarily have the technology to make it to to be able to do zooming classroom and be able to type at the same time as watching zoom there, there was a lot of things that our students did not have access to um, thank you to you know the cares act that got us the ability to to help them at the time of need but at the same time we needed to uh, find better ways um, to assume not to assume but really to talk to our students to say what is it that you need to be most successful if we need to do this this um you know online learning situation so it's important so um in a review of all of our strategies oops sorry um this group of students is not going to bend to our expectations. We're going to have to bend to their needs, point blank period. So just be prepared to work. Um, they, you know, we need to teach them and, and show them commitment through the long haul um, and avoidance of ghosting. You know, how can we teach that skill? Um, we need to find ways to publicize to them um, by communicating and not assuming. We need to get their investment as much as we need to be invested in them. Um, you know, how can we engage the entrepreneurial 
spirit, um, find ways to do that, find ways to flip the classroom wherever we can engage them in those instructional opportunities. Um, it's not only a great way for us to see that they're learning, but you know they get to see that we have trust in them as individuals and they become invested in the curriculum. Um, how can we introduce gamification and leveling up strategies? And then also find out what technology they have and, and, and have access to and they're able to utilize before assuming and, and we get in a situation where they need access to that technology. Um, as far as references go, I wanna, I'm gonna shout out these folks, these amazing, these three books, they're all done by the same people, uh, Dr. Corey C. Miller and Miss Megan Grace. Um, they, are two, they are two people who really started pushing and learning about college level, um, the impact that, the that, that Generation Z was going to have on the college level of, of student, right, right as they were really starting to apply to, to colleges and universities. Um, I highly recommend getting in touch um, if you want more information, reading that book. Generation Z Goes to College was the first um, college-related Gen Z-related book. Um, I highly recommend it. Um, if you're looking into um, if you're looking into any kind of leadership related information, I also highly recommend Generation Z Leads as well. Um, sorry, I saw a chat here. Um, of course. Um, and then lastly, let me see here. I wanna open up the discussion. Um, so if there's anything that anybody wants to throw out there or needs has ideas that they are interested in learning, um, let's talk. Tom mentions that um, Generation Z write their papers on their phones. That is not good. There is still a big tech gap in play that hurts uh, our students. I, I would agree. I've even seen it where I've been in a van driving to Orlando with a group of students. And I'm like, what are you doing? They're like, oh, I have to post this thing for my class before. And you're like, I, I, you know, and that was new to me. I would agree. I think it's important to find ways to um, help them understand the importance of utilizing different types of technology in different situations, you know? Yeah, we, we like to call them the technology generation, but <clears throat> they're not as savvy as uh, mm -hmm. we like to think they are. But also, I think it's important to point out that like when we make a website, we make it for us and not them. You're absolutely correct. And that is, that's on us. And we need to do a better job of that. I would agree with you 100% on that. Um, we need to get their feedback, their interest. Um, we need to reach out to them. Um, and I think that that's a big piece of this whole, piece, this whole puzzle is that only by asking them are we going to improve. And I think sometimes we, and especially I would say in our, our programs in CTE, we see ourselves as the experts, right? If you're an industry person, if you've had 40 years of experience as a car technician, Eligio, you could probably record, you know, like see this too, that I'm a master technician. You know, I, I, I rule this shop. I'm in charge, this is my, my reign, this is my area. And, you know, and you're not gonna have some kid coming in and telling you you're different. You know I mean? Like we have to ad ad adapt differently. Um, you know, we have to find ways to engage them. We can't, you know, the, the top down mentality is not gonna work with this group. You know, so how can we do better? Um, and sometimes they use their phones and our systems don't work correctly for them. A absolutely. Joy, your point is exactly it. Like you can't access everything on the phone. You know, so we need to find out when of, when of our, what of our, who of our students actually have computers 
who of our students actually, you know, and that's my point too, is at the very beginning of class, we need to ask them somehow in a non-embarrassing way, you know, like what type of act, what type of information, you know, like what kind of um, technology they have access to at home. Yes, uh, Marsha, you're asking a great question. We are actually gonna make the recording available on our YouTube page later on. So um, we're gonna do that. And I'm also going to upload the presentation to everyone that's here. I see people are having to run. So I wanna make sure you have this here. I'm gonna upload it into the chat so that um, hopefully. There's a question before we wrap up from yeah, David. He asks, how well do Gen Z students work together with other generations, like in a classroom setting? Say that one more time, I apologize. I how well do G Gen Z students work together with other generations, like in a classroom setting? Um, my opinion, uh, based on, again, just opinion and what we've been seeing so far, this is the group that's most likely to work with others. Um, however, um, they want to also be able to contribute and be seen as equals. You know, like they all want to work together, you know, as much as possible. Generation Z wants to, the both, they want to have everybody in equity and everybody in the same voice and everybody working toward the same goal. So wherever humanly possible, um, they want to be a part of, of what's happening. So if you can find a way to engage them with those uh, multi, multi-generational groups and organizations and things, as long as they're seen as a valid part of it and seen as an expert um, in this, whatever subject matter, they're going to be positive and work with them. Rose has, um, has a question too. She says, thank you, she's learned a lot, but she has a student that has ghosted. She's reached out, but no response. What would you do next? Um, the next piece would be, I would check with friends. And I know we don't often try to, um, we don't try to, this is a different stage for us. But one of the things is you can reach out and say to someone who's got a common, a friend in the class, just saying like, hey, have you seen, um, you know, Johnny lately? I'm trying to reach them, um, you know, um, and see if they're willing to, to step out and just do pieces like that. Because um, oftentimes if they've ghosted us, you know, the next thing to do would be call parents, um, you know, but we got to try to find them where they are or ask, or even, I had someone ask me the other day, seriously, um, can you, can you see, look where, where someone is? And I said, hold on a minute. And then I look them up on there. I had to look them up on their uh, Facebook, you know, and, and, and their Instagram. And I'm like, oh, they posted recently. So they're alive. They're okay. Um, so from there, it's a matter of let's call their emergency contact people. Are there any people in the class that maybe they're really close to? Um, you know, but but I think that that's that's the new the new way of of trying to at least find out whether or not somebody um, is is having a problem is trying to check their social media first. So that's, but we can talk more about strategies. But ghosting wise, you know, it, there's different ways to do that. You know, ask their friends in class and just ask them. You know, hey, have they been posting lately? Are they around? Uh, okay. okay. Well, would you like to close out, Eligio? I've got. Uh, yes. Um, do you have the? I do. The next week, the next one is on. Boom. April, April twenty one. Yeah. So on April twenty one, we will have a open for uh, all the memberships uh, from the Waste Commission. Uh, that way, we could do a little bit of more brainstorming of what you're needing. You can also contact us uh, in our, through our email. 
um, and let us know of some topic that you're interested. So we can, if we can offer it ourselves, we can get somebody uh, to come in and do that for us. Um, and we will be also uh, having our um, commission, our, our first commission meeting, uh, hopefully now during the Region 5 uh, annual conference. So we should have that there. That, that it's posted right now, I think that for April 15. So we'll be sending that out. Um, so on May 19, we'll have the student success stories and June 16, uh, whatever topic we have chosen from one of that, uh, that forum, open forum we do in April. Uh, thank you everybody for attending. Uh, we appreciate you all being here. Um, these are lunch and learn so that you can learn have your lunch while you're hearing what we're saying or the presentations we have. Um, I hope that this was very helpful, which even for, even though that I attended the one when he did it in, uh, in the annual conference, but today I kind of heard things that I did not hear that one. So it was very good. Thank you, Stephen, for that. Um, again, there is our website, our email. Uh, this video recording will be in YouTube also. And also in our Facebook will be the link to the YouTube uh, posted there. So thank you, everybody, and have a good afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.